Hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to our study of Philippians, where we're finishing off chapter 2 today. A chapter, if you remember, that's all about unity and humility and love. And Paul really tried to bring this home in two ways. First, by basic commandments, like we saw in verse 1 to 4, but also 12 to 15, you must do. But also through examples. He gave us the best example, Jesus Christ. But then he used himself and even Timothy. Today, he will use Epaphroditus. Now, yet Paul is writing a letter to a church. So we, we understand that when he's talking about sending Timothy and Epaphroditus, that's what he means. But we have to read between the lines. We have to go deeper in the text. It's not trying to find spiritual meaning. But you have to understand that when Paul is saying that Timothy alone cares for the things of the Lord and for the people at Philippi, that he's just making a broad statement, a generalization, and a hyperbolic language, an exaggeration. Because, of course, among all the other Christians, or even in Paul's entourage, there were people there who cared about the Philippians and the work of Christ, and they were not all focused on themselves. So there's more to it. It's, it's more of Paul lifting up Timothy and saying, you know, follow that kind of example to find that unity. And we're going to see the same thing in this discussion, who he is Epaphroditus and what he went through. And we're going to read between the lines and see that Paul is saying way more than just he's about to come. Now, let's look at this together by starting with verse 25. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. I don't miss Paul says it is necessary. He wasn't saying that with Timothy. But there's certain thing necessary here about the sending back of Epaphroditus. We'll find out soon, quickly enough. Now we need to see how Paul, first of all, really associates himself with Epaphroditus. He calls him um, his brother and fellow worker. Really, um, mine. You see how he's associating himself, connected. This is my Epaphroditus. Yeah, he, he is going to say that he is your messenger. There's this, this deep connection, like Paul saying, it's mine, he's yours, connection, like he'd been teaching them. Now, the fact he calls about, talks about fellow soldiers, a very rare term for Paul, probably because right now he's in Rome, right, where the uh, Roman army is mostly situated, or the fact that Philippi was a Roman colony, which means a lot of soldiers went there to retire. But, but still, we get the imagery. Paul is really trying to connect this man, Epaphroditus, with Paul, but also with the Philippians, right? He's their messenger and their minister. This probably points to the fact that he was part of the leadership for them, maybe even one of the head pastors, one of the dead pastors. But either way, he, he clearly had a role and, and was connected to the church of Philippi. And he was sent by them to uh, minister to his needs. Probably meaning that he came with a, a love offering, a financial help for the work of Paul. But the way it's, it's expressed, and even later on, we understand that that love offering probably was lacking something. It was good, but the fact that Paul was in prison, which meant, meant that he wasn't getting any kind of food from the government. That he, you know, the idea of being kept warm during the winter, where there's no heating back then, of course, uh, was not an easy task. And so this love offering was great, but in the long run, Paul would need more, and Epaphroditus was there to make sure of that. And we're going to find out what happened by his efforts. But first, we want to understand why did Paul have to send him back? And it was necessary. Well, here's why. Four, because he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was, because you heard, sorry, that, you, that he was ill. We see first the love of Epaphroditus for them, right? He was longing to see them. But also we see their love for him because they became distressed of finding out he was sick. And, and like we we're going to find out, even to the point of almost dying, they were heartbroken over that. Now probably the way it happened is when Epaphroditus came with this big offering, love offering, he, he had people with him because it was a big Offer you didn't travel alone with money. And they saw that he started to work and maybe work too much. 
and they brought that information back to the church of Philippi. Epaphroditus is almost working himself to death. So they got sad. Now somehow somebody else came along and said, okay, he's better now. But still, they didn't know to what extent until he had to be sent back to, to show, look, I am okay. Don't worry, people. God brought me through it. But in this, we still see this connection, right? Because Paul says that we should mourn with those who mourn and feel their sadness with them, suffer with them. And we're seeing it here. We're seeing what Paul is calling them to have in Philippi in a very palpable way. But it was, he was my Epaphroditus, but yours as well. And you were distressed to find out that he was sad, and he's sad to find out you were distressed. And even Paul got into it. Um, he says, indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but on me also. Least I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Again, remember, Paul was also connected to that. Remember, Paul said, you can make my joy push perfect by the way you guys would be humble and loving each other in a unity of humility. And so he also felt the pain of seeing the Barphrodite is so sad. And I dare say the sorrow upon sorrow is probably because of the idea that if he dies, the church of Philippi will be more sad. I don't want him to die and then to be sad. That's just too much grief. And God have mercy on that. So yeah, he's giving clear information, telling us about the mercy of God. But I can't help but see this connection, like I said, that we sorrow for those who sorrow, that we suffer with those who suffer. What he's calling for the Philippian church, they were living out right then and there with that story of Epaphroditus. Paul continues to tell them, I am the more eager, again, this item necessary, more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. And of course, you have to understand the context of less anxious is much joyful, because this is the epistle of joy, right? The epistle of joy, that's, yes, a joy in the Lord, chapter 4 will tell us, but as we've seen in chapter 2, it's a joy so found in one another. As much as we're called to suffer with those who suffer and mourn with them, we're also called to rejoice with them. We're called to have this kind of uh, happiness and, and, and joyousness when we see faithfulness in their walk or, or repentance from sin or, in this case, healing from sickness. We rejoice with them. You're better now. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I rejoice with you. But I love the connection, this idea that Paul's... Um, Deliverance from anxiousness, if you will, this tasting of joy, will be found in the fact that they will be joyous because he's coming back. And he will be joyous to see them joyous, and Paul will be joyous that he's joyous and that they're joyous. That's a lot of joy found in this community. Because like I said, it's, it's also a joy found with one another. Paul moves on and says, So, Here's the way you should, you should then react, guys. Receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. Again, this call to joy in unity, right? This joy of he's better, God has healed him, and you can be just together with God's mercy. This joy found in him about him being better and what he was able to do by the grace of God over there. But I like that he also adds this idea of honoring him. Not, not because they weren't, of course, or as some suggested that maybe they were fighting with Epaphroditus and God, Paul was saying, stop fighting with him. No, I don't think so. But it is a, a reminder that they should honor, not because he was a street preacher or a great evangelist or built a big church in Rome or was a prayer warrior, but because he, he provided for Paul. Yeah, that, that's the idea. But when we continue and finish this, he explains why. Why should you honor him? For he nearly died for the work of Christ. And he explains how, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Now, I understand when he's talking about lacking in your service, he doesn't say you didn't do enough. But he's saying this amazing love offering, which was a great sacrificial gift from you, wouldn't be enough to supply for all my needs. But because he was sent from you, and in your name, he was willing to work with his hands. Him, a minister, remember? 
right? He could have said, I'm a pastor, man. I'll help you, Paul, to witness, but I'm not going to work. But no, he, he worked with his hand, probably enough to provide for himself, of course. He's in Rome. He has no home. And for Paul, so working himself night and day almost to death in a time where there's not as much medicine and health as now, working himself to death to provide for himself and for Paul in the name of Philippi, because it's all about unity. And that Paul calls the work of Christ. I find that absolutely beautiful. The example that Paul is presenting here through Epaphroditus, a man who is serving the Lord not as a minister or a pastor, no, as a guy who worked with his hands to provide for himself, as anyone should, but also for Paul, who desperately needed it to stay alive. And that in the name of the Philippians, right? he was doing it for them in their name. That's what he means by uh, lacking in the service to me. It's, it's not you didn't give enough. It's he was representing you, not just in the law of offering. This kind of sacrificial giving is what should be honored and called the work of Christ. I love that. In the day and age where everybody wants to title and name, I'm a prophet this, and I'm an apostle that, I'm a doctor this. Paul says, this man was a man of God, working for the service of Christ, should be honored because he worked with his hand to provide for me. And I would have died without that. And he almost died to make that happen. Beautiful, right? There's another reason why he's presented to them, of course, and it's this call to this unity of, of suffering with those who suffer and rejoicing with those who rejoice. Like I said, this connection is so deep and profound and unbreakable that we feel each other's pain and rejoice for each other's success. This is what Paul is putting forward, I believe, under the, uh, uh, in between the lines, if you will, of this sending of the Epaphroditus. Remember, uh, at this point, he's already back. He probably came with the letter. So that they saw he's okay, they hugged him, and then Paul thought about it. He didn't have to. They could have just seen it for himself, but he took the time to talk about Epaphroditus because he's teaching them through these words. And I hope he's teaching us as well. So may the Lord help us to take these two examples, two parts of the example to heart. Let's pray. Oh Lord, thank you again for this word of God. And this man, Epaphroditus, and yeah, the, the leading of writing about this, this part of the story that we would have never known if Paul didn't put it in there, if the Spirit didn't inspire it. And so we know there's something there for us, Lord. And we pray that it, we would not look for these great titles or, or, or you know, wash our hands of any kind of dirty work and realize that all of it is a work unto you. A glass of water, caring for prisoners, it's all unto you, Lord, and we want to do that. We want to do that because that honors you. And I pray also, Lord, that we would seek that kind of unity that really suffers with those who suffer and rejoice with them, where we forget about ourselves and we consider the community and each other, Lord. Help us to die to ourselves in this way, we pray. Help your church to find that kind of unity that we can't by ourselves. We're selfish, Lord. Help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And that, but it's just, I hope this has been a very uh, blessed time in chapter two, and you're looking forward to chapter three. Be blessed.